Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. That's right. Always classic, still classy. Always classic, sometimes classy. Maybe we'll put that on the t-shirt, if we remember, to make them after this recording. Zach and I, we, we knit our clothes. We do. We, we knit our clothes all by ourselves. All of our clothes. All of our clothes. Underwear, socks. Yep. Company mandated long underwear. Yes. We even knit uh, the producer's clothes. Yeah, he doesn't like it because we always include the wrong amount of arms. Yeah, he needs three. I like the lore we're building around <laughs> producer Doug as this three-armed, chain-smoking, <laughs> cigar-smoking J. Jonah Jameson. But to be honest, he's only been three-armed recently. Like, a freak accident gave him a third arm. We didn't get him the Spider-Man photos fast enough. So it gave him a third arm. Instead of Spider-Man powers. What if that happened? to peter parker <laughs> wait what like if he got bit by a radioactive spider and instead of becoming a spider he just grew like a third appendage there's the the, the storyline where it's like the what if where he grows extra arms oh yeah yeah no but no what if he just grew like a vestial third arm and then it was just like the end <laughs> you know of all the type of accidents to have uh having an accident that gives you a new arm is certainly better than the alternative <laughs> <laughs> that's true anyway uh, Zach. Yes, Seth. What have you been recently been playing? Seth, recently I've been playing StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm. Heart of the Swarm came out in March of 2013, and I think I was talking about StarCraft II a long time ago, back when I was playing Wings of Liberty, which was a while ago, I don't even remember. And Heart of the Swarm is the second one, right? Yes, Heart of the Swarm is the second campaign in the StarCraft II storyline. It is the Zerg campaign. Uh, you play the role of Sarah Kerrigan, who has turned human again at the end of Wings of Liberty. You have been saved by Rainer's Raiders and are in a facility being run by Valerian Minxed. And uh, Valerian wants you to see if you can use your Zerg powers still because you were the Queen of Blades, but you're back as a human. So he tasks you with like controlling a few drones and building a hive and stuff like that. And then the facility gets attacked by the Dominion and the Dominion supposedly kill Jim Rayner and Sarah goes very crazy. Yeah, because Sarah likes Jim. A lot. She gets so upset about Jim dying. She goes to a planet with some Zerg and she immediately starts controlling the Zerg. And then she basically just becomes the Queen of Blades all over again. <laughs> yeah, she should know Jim can't die. A, he is in a prison cell. B, with his gun, according to the cutscene <laughs> when they find him. He has his gun in his holster and she literally does the thing where she like takes his gun out of his holster for him and puts it to her forehead and is like you said you're going to kill the queen of blades and i'm like why didn't they take his gun because it's jim that's his part of why would somebody take his hand the gun is part of jim i just really wanted uh starcraft 2 to be like a buddy cop movie between zero to jim rayner because that's what starcraft 1 is i really wanted heart of the swarm to be a buddy cop between sarah kerrigan and alexi stukov who shows up halfway through the camp <laughs> pain covered in zerg parts that's because he was left to die <laughs> i know it's i love alexi though because he shows up and he's still wearing his big captain's hat but he's covered in zerg parts you know what the fun part about alexi stukov and uh, admiral de gaulle so in the original game alexi stukov and admiral de gaulle are part of the united earth directorate mm -hmm. and admiral de gaulle uh leaves alexi stukov behind to be over swarmed by zerg yeah and at the end of starcraft admiral de gaulle has failed and he ends up blowing his brains out. But Alexei Stukov just became a Zerg. <laughs> yeah, with like pretty much all of his memories intact, he's just now a Zerg. Yeah, he's just now a Zerg. Yeah, so in the in the storyline, your task is originally playing as Sarah getting revenge on the Dominion for killing Jim Rayner, but then you find out that Jim Rayner was just captured. So then your job is to get revenge on the Dominion for capturing Jim Rayner. And it's a fun campaign. I really liked it. I thought it balanced some of my favorite parts of StarCraft with the plus of playing as the Zerg. I love the Zerg. I think the Zerg are a fun race to play as in StarCraft, especially in StarCraft 2. Um, so when you're playing in the campaign, you have some options available to how you want to level up your Zerg through things called mutations. And the mutations allow you to do different things, such as, for example, making Zerglings that are able to fly or <laughs> making Zerglings instead of fly reproduce more frequently so that there are like two Zerglings spawned from one egg. Four Zerglings spawned from one egg, I think. Instead my goal was I wanted to have as many Zerg as humanly possible on the screen. So I literally upgraded all the things that gave me swarm abilities. So for example,
example, I upgraded my Zerg to spawn four at a time. I upgraded um, the, I forget what they're called. They look like beetles, but when they shoot acid, it spawned mini versions of them that came out. I then had a thing where uh, Sarah herself would spawn mini drones from her whenever she would kill someone. So I just constantly had these large armies of tiny things attacking people. And it was great. I overwhelmed my enemies very easily. Uh, by the end, I had an ability where Sarah could call in a drop pod of like an army of feral zerg um, that would just do their own thing and spread across the screen. I have to go play through StarCraft 2 again. I don't think I actually beat the Protoss campaign. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be starting the Protoss campaign. I've been in a very serious RTS kick recently, so um, I was probably going to take a break between StarCraft to play some Doom Eternal because I, I picked that up for the PC. So I was going to replay Doom Eternal, but on the PC. Um, and then uh, I might go back and play through the Protoss campaign. I, I think the Protoss are fun. I, I think out of all the StarCraft races, I think the Zerg are hilarious because you can do swarm techniques. The Terrans are very middle ground. And I think the Protoss are like a weird mix. They're very energy based. So you have to have like your pylons and your stuff giving you energy in certain places. You can't just build wherever you want. Anyway, uh, Seth, what have you been recently playing? So recently I've been playing something uh, very different from StarCraft. Uh, recently I've been playing Four Last Things, which was developed and published by Joe Richardson. Four Last Things is a point and click adventure game. Surprise that I'm playing that. But it's made from Renaissance era paintings and public domain recordings of classical music. The game is about uh, sin and the last four things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And it's very silly. The game starts off with you playing this guy who's going to church to get his sins removed through the bishop who's there and uh he there's a line of people standing outside the church who've all committed different sins and he gets up to the bishop and he says hello i'm here to have my sins removed and the bishop said oh, where did you sin and he says why well, I, I sinned over in this town and the bishop said oh, we don't have jurisdiction over there <laughs> <laughs> but we're giving away free removal of sins today, so you don't have to pay for it. Which is why everyone came to the church, because they are giving free removal of sins. And so the bishop said, well, here's the deal. We have no jurisdiction over the sins that you've committed in other towns. However, if you commit sins in our town, then when we forgive you of all your sins, we can forgive them all at once. Uh, so we would forgive the sins from the other town by nature of forgiving all of the sins at once. So your character has to go and sin and has to do the seven deadly sins. Uh, so you have to go into town and and, and and try to figure out how to commit uh, seven deadly sins. There is also a sequel to the game. The sequel is the procession to Calvary and somehow the character from Four Last Things becomes the king of the world in procession from Calvary and you play as a, a murdering knight who likes to murder things and is told they can't murder things anymore because the war is over. So then they have to be told where they have to go to where they can murder people some more because that's what they like doing is killing people. So the art the style of this is as it, if somebody took classical paintings and cut them out and made them like paper dolls and spread them throughout a world of classical paintings is essentially what the art style of the game is. And it's just it's just wonky and weird, but it's a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, so four last things. A uh, great little pickup for uh, a little independent game and uh, a lot of wacky fun. If you're a big fan of like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, then you'll probably like four last things. It just has that that Monty Python feel to it with like the, um, the weird classical graphics that they used to do with the show um with like the big foot coming down and stuff like that so that's very similar to the art style of it's like it's if like monty python that crew made a video game that sounds fun i might have to check that out well today we're talking about something different we're talking about a game that has been in the news lately because of a recent release uh and we're talking about something that i don't know if this is technically a listener request um, so Seth said that uh, someone he knows suggested that we talk about Final Fantasy VII. And I said, okay, so we're talking about Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, so this would be a, um, our, one of our listeners, uh, Brent, who I also work with. Brent, this episode is for you. Hopefully it lives up to your expectations. If not, uh, let Seth know in person. Uh, Seth, do you have any memories of Final Fantasy VII? Not really. Like, so Final Fantasy VII is your is the Cloud Strife game. I was going to say Mick Strife. Cloud Mick Strife? Yeah. So I'm aware of it. I don't think anyone being raised in the time of this era would not know of Final Fantasy VII. But I actually haven't really 
played a lot of it. I'm definitely more of a, a, a Final Fantasy VI guy, which was also Final Fantasy III. Mm-hmm. It was a 2D game um, with 16-bit sprites. That was more my jam. And I also played Final Fantasy II, which is the, uh, the one with the Dragoons. So I played a lot of that game. I be, I actually think that is the only Final Fantasy I actually beat. I have not beaten 6 as much as I've played it, and I honestly, I think I've played only just a fraction of 7. I've considered trying to get around to playing it, but uh, I just, I haven't. But uh, yeah, it's on my, my forever to-do list. Yeah, I have an interesting relationship with the Final Fantasy games in that I have always wanted to play them, but I find big-scale RPG games very daunting to me. And these style of RPGs, RPG games, the like 16-bit era and 8-bit era and stuff like that. Also very daunting to me. Like part of me wants to make sure I can do it right. And also part of me also is like, I- I'm definitely going to get lost the moment I start that game, which is probably a silly thing to think. But at the same time, it's just the way I've always kind of looked at those games. I definitely want to visit these games. Like I definitely want to play through them at some point. I just haven't spent a lot of time playing them. I played parts of them. And in terms of Final Fantasy VII, I have a copy of it on Steam and I have I've played a bit of it and I also have a copy of it for the PS1. I haven't played through the whole thing. I've played only like first maybe hour or so of the game, which is not a ton of, of gameplay, <laughs> but uh, I, I did play through some of it. However, uh, growing up, our dad uh, had a copy of Kingdom Hearts, which features a lot of Final Fantasy characters. So before I was very familiar with Final Fantasy 7, I was familiar with Cloud and Sephiroth and Aerith and Sid Highwind and the Moogles and Yuffie because they all appear in the first Kingdom Hearts. But um, at, at the time, I really didn't know where those characters were coming from when I first played Kingdom Hearts and then I later learned about Final Fantasy 7 I was like oh those are those characters uh, and I think I learned that actually from a family friend of ours Seth and I used to go to a family friend of ours our mom had a friend um, and she had two daughters and sometimes we would stay over their house during parts of the summer when our mom was working and I remember the older sister had a PS2 and she had games like Dot Hack and Kingdom Hearts and she had the Final Fantasy games and I remember playing through Kingdom Hearts on her PS2 and her telling me these characters are from Final Fantasy and I was like that makes a ton of sense now what didn't make sense to me is the fact that my only other experience with Final Fantasy was the movie Spirits Within which oh right yeah yeah it's very different from Final Fantasy 7 but also has some similarities in any case we're going to talk about Final Fantasy 7 but to do so we're going to talk a bit about Square we previously did talk about Final Fantasy games when we talked about jrpgs with our guest mike case way back in episode 45 yeah it was almost 200 episodes ago right and i actually mentioned that to brent brent asked me if i if we've done a final fantasy 7 episode already and i said well we did a jrpg episode and uh i was like you can go listen to that and i was like we had our buddy mike case on it it has been a while since we talked to mike and let's give a little refresher about square because we talked about final fantasy when we talked to mike but i don't think we went into like detail we did talk about before we go into the history we did talk about how you had to have a cartridge to save your game in Final Fantasy 7 and if it didn't you had to continue to play the game from the beginning oh like a memory card yeah yeah the memory card the, yeah you had to have a memory card and uh, and that's what Mike did for Christmas was just play the game over and over again yes yeah that's sad that's a fun story Final Fantasy itself was first released back in 1987 by Square for the Famicom and it was brought to the NES in May of 1990 Square as a company got their story start as a subsidiary of Den Yusha by Masafumi Miyamoto, the son of Den Yusha's owner. Miyamoto had been working in a part-time position at Kyo University. It was not necessarily interested in working for Den Yusha, as they were primarily involved in electrical power, so he really didn't want to go into his father's business. He instead wanted to go into software and would work on getting into the video game market from the Yokohama branch of his father's company. Miyamoto had a unique vision for video games for the time. In the 19- 1980s, video games were primarily done by one person or small teams, at least in Japan. But Miyamoto envisioned that he could bring on teams of people to work as programmers, graphic designers, and storytellers. Miyamoto would bring on some of his friends as employees of the growing company and work to start building out ways of recruiting talent. He hired at this time part-time students Hironobu Sakaguchi and Hiromichi Tanaka. By 1984, Miyamoto's software spinoff of his father's company had become
become Square, and would start to make games for computers like the NEC PC 8801, with their first being a text adventure called The Death Trap. The following year, in 1985, Square had begun working with Nintendo to secure a third-party deal to develop games for the Famicom. Once everything was signed off, they began work on producing games for the system, with their first game being a port of the game Thexter in 1985, and their first original title, King's Knight, a scrolling shooter in 1986. Square was beginning to grow and grow, with their capital being about 10 million yen by uh, September of 1986. At the same time, Hironobu Sakaguchi had been pitching an idea of an RPG game to the heads of Square. He had been working on projects like King's Knight and was not a fan of these type of action games. Square consistently would reject his pitches out of fear that they would underperform until 1986 when Enix released Dragon Quest. Now, suddenly RPGs did not see like a shot in the dark and they could support such a project that is similar to dragon quest because before square enix became square enix they were square and they were enix and they were competitors <laughs> yes and when your competitor puts out a game that does very well you're going to want to copy your competitor so dragon quest came out and square said all right i know you've been pitching us some some game for quite a while and we've been ignoring you but now it looks like there's money to be had so miyamoto allowed sakaguchi to begin to work on his rpg which he had initially titled fighting fantasy but quickly changed the name to final fantasy to avoid a potential trademark issue with a tabletop rpg of the same name fighting fantasy which i am not aware of so apparently the tabletop rpg was is no longer as popular as it was it's also called advanced fighting fantasy it's a british tabletop role-playing game well yeah a lot of the games during that time were british because it's probably like a steve jackson game it was uh ian livingstone and steve jackson the steve jackson the board game guy not steve jackson the steve british. jackson the british man not steve jackson the american <laughs> the american uh one works on video games one works on board games uh anyway uh he also um picked the name final fantasy because he earnestly believed that it was his last chance to make something worth putting effort into it it was his final fantasy <laughs> sakaguchi had told himself that if his game turned out to be a flop he would quit square and return to school abandoning his creative endeavors uh however much to his and Square's surprise the game did really well uh final fantasy would sell 400,000 units in japan alone when it was released in 1987 and would pave the way for future games in the series its sequel in fact final fantasy 2 the game that i talked about in my memories uh released the next year and would sell even better about 800,000 copies in japan a third sequel final fantasy 3 came out the next year 1990 and it would also sell really well about 1.4 million copies in japan as of a report from 2003 now the same year final fantasy 3 released so would the north american version of final fantasy for the nes which had been localized to remove a few minor things for censorship reasons now Despite historical RPG games not selling well in North America, Final Fantasy would sell upwards of 700,000 copies when it hit the American market, and thus would be a worldwide success. The Famicom versions of Final Fantasy 2 II and 3 would not be immediately localized, with North America getting a localized version of SNES Final Fantasy 4 as Final Fantasy 2 in 1991, which is actually the Final Fantasy game that I played and beat, and later a localized version of Final Fantasy VI as Final Fantasy III in 1994. You can now go and find the original the Final Fantasies II and III, the Japanese versions. They have now been localized. Are they swapped? No. What are, where, where are they? in the numbers but they're just called two and three now they just renamed the numbering system was very weird back then now after the release of final fantasy 6 in japan the team got to work coming up with their ideas for final fantasy 7 square had just finished chrono trigger in 1995 another rpg for the snes and they were thinking of ways to develop the new final fantasy to the 16-bit hardware that the snes had to offer however 16-bit games were starting to fall by the wayside consoles like the n64 were due out the next year and the playstation had launched the year prior. Games were evolving from their limited sprite-based pixel art and were moving into the world of 3D and full motion video. Square internally had a choice to make. Stick with Nintendo 
or move to Sony. Ultimately, the decision was made to move to Sony for a few reasons. One was that the cost of creating a cartridge-based game had increased substantially due to a chip shortage, but the other was that the technology that Sony had to offer was simply better than what Nintendo could provide. Tests were done for the Nintendo 64 DD, the failed floppy disk add-on, but it was determined that in order to properly render certain ideas that the team had, the frame rate of the game would ultimately suffer. Per report at the time, if Final Fantasy VII were to be ported over to the N64DD, it would have to fit on approximately 30 floppy disks, even with the data compressed using tools at the time. The answer was frankly simple. Sony was cheaper and CD-ROMs could do more than a cartridge ever could. When the decision was made, it reportedly shocked the community. Nintendo and Square had been so uniquely tied together that Nintendo would sell off their shares of Square and silence all communication between the companies for five years, which is really interesting to say the least, that these two companies were so close together that Nintendo effectively felt betrayed trade that Square would go to another company. Now, in terms of actual development, a plan was made initially to use 2D sprites and place them in a 3D world, but this was rejected. The team would use 3D models, which allowed them to play around with how the characters expressed emotion and have more in-depth interactions with the environment around them. The team had reportedly also been inspired to use more of a polygonal style to the characters, mostly because they were fans of the game Alone in the Dark. To develop the graphics, the team would use a Silicon Graphics Onyx supercomputer and the software Soft Image 3D N World and Power Animator. In total, this was set them back $21 million, or about $38 million today. In terms of the budget, Final Fantasy VII was one of the most expensive games ever produced at the time. The total costs ended up being around $40 million, about $73 million today. These high costs were largely due to the fact that Square's insistence that the game be quote-unquote passion-based, in that they wanted their teams to not feel limited by their ideas. Square was highly successful, so they could do this. They had the money, they had the capital, they could tell the developers, oh, you want to do this with your game? Go right ahead, take your time, do whatever you want. And that's exactly what they did. They told their developers not to worry and don't focus on the budget, focus on making the game as big as you want. Final Fantasy VII also set another record in that it had one of the largest teams to develop a game at that point. There were around 150 people working on the game. They also had a split team with some members in Los Angeles and some in Japan. So in many ways, it lived up to the expectations that Miyamoto had when he founded Square in that he wanted these games to be developed by large teams with everyone split up and doing different things. While moving the game from cartridge to CD-ROM took away a lot of headaches, it also caused new ones. CD-ROMs do not have direct access like a cartridge does. When a piece of software on a CD-ROM has to access data, the drive needs to do the necessary actions to seek and read that data spinning the CD-ROM versus just accessing it immediately. This can cause load times as the data is read. So the developers had to work up ways to make the load times feel shorter. Interestingly enough, when CD-ROM games were coming out, the load time was was reading the CD, right? The combination of reading the CD and loading the data. And now games are just, they're just so stinking big that the load time is the game trying to figure out <laughs> itself. <laughs> Yeah. Like, it's just like, I know that this level's here somewhere. Let me go look <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. Where before it was the CD-ROM actually moving around, trying to figure it out. I blame CD-ROMs for us accepting load times. So the developers had to work up fun ways to make the load time feel shorter. And this was done through use of animations and other techniques. I also always wonder whether or not the bar that's on a loading screen is actually a true bar of progress. And I don't think it is. I, th I think they're almost always just, just an animation to make you think yeah. that it's working. Uh, Resident Evil employed this too with the, the door sequence. So whenever you enter a room in Resident Evil 1, uh, it would go to like just this animation of a door opening into nothing. That was just done to mask load times. The, the load times aren't any shorter. It's just done to make you think they are going by faster. If you see an end to the load time and you see a progress bar filling, you can kind of gauge how much time you have in between too. Now the game would also employ two types of cutscenes full motion video and in-game. 
The full motion video was produced by VisualWorks, who were a subsidiary of Square. The in-game cutscenes would be done with the player models on the pre-rendered backgrounds of the world. Graphics are handled uniquely in that the backgrounds of the world you explore are pre-rendered. This allowed the backgrounds to be heavily detailed and expansive without having to render them in real time. The character, in turn, are placed on the pre-rendered background with their movements restricted using specific collision parameters and techniques used to scale the figures when they move deeper into the background or closer to the camera. Part of this was also done as a storytelling tool, as the game director's Yoshinori Katasi was a fan of movies and really wanted the game to have a cinematic quality to it. If you've ever seen the like in-game graphics of Final Fantasy VII characters, they're very silly looking. They are like very blocky, right. small, stout little feet people on these like gorgeous rendered graphics very like realistic looking uh like they'll be in this dark gritty looking like you know room and you'll just have these really colorful looking characters walking around in it it's kind of it's fun i like it the art of the game was done by art director yatsuke nara who had previously worked on final fantasy 6 uh when the team had decided to make the game in 3d nara reportedly had to essentially reteach himself as he was only familiar with 2d art and he soon took on a dedicated artist who worked on the visuals of the game. This encompassed everything from designing the characters, the textures, the environments, effects, and animating the characters. The main character designs were handled by Tetsuya Nomura, who had initially pitched his ideas to Sakaguchi via handwritten notes with drawings on them. Sakaguchi liked this uh, as other people would pitch their notes via type notes on the PC, but Nomura gave handwritten notes, so he brought Nomura on solely because of his handwritten notes notes well he probably also brought along because he was a capable artist now the music in the game is great it was composed by nobu uyamatsu who previously worked on other final fantasy musics uyamatsu had planned to use higher quality music thanks to the perks of using cd-roms however he did notice that the higher quality music meant slower loading times and to save on loading times he decided instead to use midi style music as the playstation had a more powerful sound chip than the snes his midi music for Final Fantasy VII could be much more vibrant music than previous games and was able to have the soundtrack sound overall more epic in scale while still saving on loading times and not making it CD quality audio. He would still use some digitized voices in some of the tracks, such as the track One Winged Angel. <laughs> After about a year of overall work on the game, Final Fantasy VII would release in Japan on January 31st, 1997. The North America and PAL versions would be released later that year in September and November, respectively. Also of note was the fact that the game was released on three discs, and eventually a Windows version of the game would be released in 1998. There was always ta- there was always people talking about the three discs and how you had to like like switch it out and if any yeah. of your disc is scratched or anything. Yeah. It'd no, be very it, sad. You get a you get a thing that pops up that's like insert disc two now. <laughs> it doesn't say that. But that's me saying that. But it, like that's the text, and then you you put it in now. Final Fantasy VII, in terms of its gameplay, like the games that preceded it, was a turn-based RPG. When your party encounters enemies, your field of view changes so that you see the enemies on the field next to you, and you choose what actions you take, such as attacking, using a potion, using magic, and then you proceed to take those actions, and then the enemies do their actions against you, and it repeats until uh, the enemies die or you die. A new feature to VII is Limit Breaks. With a party of four or more, your team will have a limit gauge that will increase as the battle progresses. When it is done filling up, you will activate a limit break, which typically consists of a fancy special attack that does a ton of damage. Each party member has a unique limit break, which allows for more variety in how you tackle a boss. The story itself of Final Fantasy VII is a bit complex. Also, I'm going to put a minor spoiler thing here. Final Fantasy VII has been out since the 1990s. There's a thing that happens in this game that some people uh, recall being very surprised by it happening, but it came out almost 30 years ago. So, if you if, if you missed this thing that is so big, I'm sorry, but you probably know what I'm talking about. In any case, to summarize, 
you play as Cloud Strife. Cloud is a part of an eco-terrorist group called Avalanche and works alongside Barrett Wallace and Tifa Lockhart. Barrett's really cool. He has a chain gun for an arm. Cloud claims to be a former first class unit of Soldier, an elite military group. Uh, that's just a fun fact about him. Your group is as they are an eco-terrorist group have been targeting Shinra, an electric power company that maintains control over the city of Midgard and most of the world. As your team of eco-terrorists destroy a reactor that is being run by Shinra, and on your way to destroy the reactor, you meet Aerith Gainsborough, one of the last Cetras, a mystical tribe of people who have a close tie to nature and the planet. Shinra kidnaps Aerith as they want to find the location of a place called the Promised Land and believe that she can lead them there, mainly so that they can tap into the energy and sell it. After rescuing Aerith, the team encounter Sephiroth, a soldier first class that was presumed dead, who then goes on to murder the president of Shinra as part of a ploy to have the president's son Rufus take on the role. The team are then tracking down Sephiroth, and they are tracking him down because he plans to destroy the world using something called Black Materia, um, and he plans to use Black Materia to summon a giant meteor to crash into the world and blow everything up, which is why the symbol for Final Fantasy VII is a meteor. Now, Aerith confronts Sephiroth, and he kills her in front of Cloud in this very dramatic moment that plays really sad music. After this happens, aliens get involved. Uh, and they had previously been on Earth uh, or the planet like thousands of years ago that they were uh, captured and imprisoned. And then the tomb that they're in gets uh, opened by Shinra because they're drilling. And it turns out that their cells were used to create Sephiroth and like an army of Sephiroth clones. It gets weird really fast if it hasn't gotten weird yet. Uh, you also learn a bit more about Cloud, uh, specifically in the second part of the game where it's revealed that he was never a member of Soldier. His memories are actually that of his friend, Zack. Cloud had been part of an infantry team that was sent to track down Sephiroth, and later part of a series of experiments conducted on him by a Shinra scientist named Hojo. The experience led to Zack's death, and Cloud to become traumatized to the point of reconstructing Zack's memories as his own. Now those are just some, those are just some hard-hitting points about this game. This game is a complex story, and that's just uh, to say the least. My summary probably does not do it justice, and I probably got a lot of things wrong. But if any anything ever happened to you i would reconstruct your memories as my own i appreciate that thank you seth it'd be weird but it'd be fine uh the game was an instant success in japan upon release it would sell over two million copies in three days and i bet that made square very happy now in the united states demand became so great that retailers would break uh, their allowed street date to get copies into the hands of the public faster. In its three weeks in the U.S., the game would go on to sell 500,000 copies. By 2005, the game had sold over 9.8 million copies, with 4 million of those being in just Japan. The game was also critically acclaimed on release with positive reviews across the board. The publication All Game gave the game five stars. Computer Gaming World gave the PC version four out of five stars. GameSpot gave the game 9.5 out of 10. Next Generation gave the game five stars. And Game Informer gave the game a 9.75 out of 10. The game was given numerous Games of the Year awards throughout the year of 1997, including the Console Role-Playing Game of the Year, the Console Adventure Game of the Year, from the Academy of Interactive Arts and Science Interactive Achievement Awards. The game has also been constantly included in the best of list for games getting number four in Retro Gamer's Top 100 Games in 2004, number two in Empire's 100 Greatest Games of All Times, and 15th in Game Informer's Top 200 Games of All Times. Game Spy, however, rated at number seven on their list of the most overrated games in 2003. So, Game Spy, what have you been doing lately? Not much. Remember when you had to use Game Spy to uh, play multiplayer with games with people? Yeah. <laughs> In terms of criticism, some people did feel that the English translation had some problems, such as typos and grammatical errors. Other people also noted that the plot was a bit confusing, which, based on Zach's summary, I 
could see that. Now, in terms of its legacy, Final Fantasy VII would spawn a whole meta series just about Final Fantasy VII that encompasses the world and the characters. This meta series has been referred to as the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, and it includes a variety of things. Also, something we didn't touch upon when I, we talked about the story, which I probably should touch upon now. You don't need to play Final Fantasy one through six to play Final Fantasy VII. If you want to play just Final Fantasy VII, go ahead just play it. Perfectly fine. None of the Final Fantasy games have canon to each other beyond a few exceptions, and those exceptions are clearly labeled. Like, for example, Final Fantasy X has a sequel called Final Fantasy X-2. Those games are connected, but Final Fantasy VIII does not take off where the end of Final Fantasy VII is. It's just a new game called Final Fantasy, which is also why they'll do things like create meta series. So they'll create a whole bunch of Final Fantasy VII related things because they want to capitalize on the success of that one one game. But before we get into talking about the meta series, let's talk about ports. The game was officially ported to iOS, PlayStation 4, Android, Nintendo Switch, and Xbox One. Unofficially, and rather infamously, the game was also backported to the Famicom by a company called Shenzhen Nanjing Technology. Shenzhen Nanjing's version of the game plays more like the original Famicom versions, but is based on their own RPG engine. It's a unique engine to their company, and it's not a hack of an existing game. There are some differences, as Nanjing's version does not have the original soundtrack, and certain characters don't quite look right. Barrett, for example, is white in the Shenzhen Nanjing version when he is not white in the original game. Many of these changes were fixed in an English translation slash improvement hack that was made by just general fans of Final Fantasy. The hack translates the Chinese into English, it also fixes numerous glitches, and other issues that are found in the original pirated version. One thing that is interesting to note of the original Shenzhen Nanjing version is that it was released for Subor Famiclone systems, so that it actually has trouble working on some non-clone hardware. So if you plug in a original copy of the Shenzhen Nanjing Final Fantasy VII into your non-clone Famicom, then it might glitch out. Now, in terms of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, part of this compilation is, of course, the movie Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, which came out in 2003. It should not be confused with the other movie, Final Fantasy VII The Spirits Within, which came out in 2001. Advent Children takes place two years after Final Fantasy VII The Game. It features Cloud Strife going up against Sephiroth. The movie is entirely done in CGI and features some really impressive fight sequences and pieces. A re-release of the movie was made in 2009 called Final Fantasy VII Advent Children Complete, which features higher quality visuals and is 26 minutes longer than the original cut. Beyond the movie, there are also games that take place in the Final Fantasy VII universe. Specifically, Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, Dirge of Cerberus Final Fantasy VII, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy VII The First Soldier, Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis, and many of these were released to coincide with the re makes. And yes, recently, Final Fantasy VII has been back in gaming news as part two of the remakes was released on February 29th, 2024, which is fun because that is in the past for the release of this episode, but in the future for the recording of this episode, because time is fake. The first part of the remakes called Final Fantasy VII Remake was released in 2020 and re-released in 2021 as Final Fantasy VII Remake Intergrade. The changes to the game are in terms of mostly gameplay and graphics. Gone are the 3D player models with funny proportions, and in are the more realistic looking player models uh, that are a bit more similar to the more recent Final Fantasy games that have come out, like 15. Another thing that is gone is the turn-based combat. Instead, the game uses real-time combat, another similarity to Final Fantasy 15, as that game also has real-time combat. The sequel to Final Fantasy VII Remake, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, as mentioned, came out very recently and covers the second half of the original game. And that will do it for our Final Fantasy VII episode. Uh, I think it's an interesting series. I think it's kind of fascinating in its own right that it holds up almost completely separate from the rest of the Final Fantasy world. Like, you can really talk about Final Fantasy VII and play it without having a single experience of Final Fantasy before that or after that. Um, it is a yeah. very much standalone game that, um, and most of the Final Fantasy games are standalone games, but I think Final Fantasy VII is unique in that it came out at the right time in the right place. Specifically, the 90s on the PlayStation. That's right. That's right. And now they're up to Final Fantasy... Final Fantasy 16 came out last year uh, in 2023. I assume there'll be a 17. Well, maybe we'll find out if Square's at PAX. 
Yeah, we'll ask them. Anyway, to move on to the uh, the retro rewind, uh, Zach had me play Romance of the Three Kingdoms, which is based on the historical novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms by Lu Guanzhao. Now, uh, Luo uh, was not involved in the game because the novel was released in the 14th century, and the game would go on to be released in 1985. Telling me that people from the 14th century weren't around in 1985? No, no, they were not. Uh, the game was released in 1985, and it was for the PC-88, which is a Japanese 8-bit computer, and then had a broader release on home consoles such as the NES, MSX, and Wonder Swan, and various other home computers. Uh, it would be developed and published by uh, Koyai. In the game, you governed uh, some provinces of China, labeled with numbers, and it received, at the time, really great reviews for strategy players and represented a, a fun historical simulation game. Uh, however, the graphics are relatively simple, the controls are a little obtuse, and I assume a manual would help you get to understand what's actually going on, because I'm pretty sure I started a game, but I don't know if I even assigned myself uh, a person, because I had no options to do anything and could just watch the game go by. So so I guess fault on me for not figuring out how to play the game uh, when I just booted it up. So I don't know if it necessarily holds up today as a fun strategy game if you're a strategy lover to run off to play, but I think for its time, it was pretty good. Zach, next week you can play Alfred Chicken for NES. I will. Thank you, Seth. Seth had me play Gary Kitchen's Super Battle Tank War in the Gulf, originally released in 1992 from Absolute Entertainment and designed by Gary Kitchen. The game is 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 a tank simulation game. It puts you behind the wheel, I guess you could say, of an M1 Abrams during Operation Desert Storm. Your first mission is to Kuwait, and you're tasked with destroying enemy tanks and avoiding civilian casualties, which are the two things it tells you to do when the game starts. It says, avoid civilian casualties, destroy the enemy. Are there uh, civilian tanks in the game? <laughs> <laughs> there aren't, but that, that'd be... That'd be interesting. The game's okay. It's from like a first person perspective. It's got kind of like fake 3D. Basically you moving your tank around to a specific place and trying to find the enemy tank, which I had trouble doing. There is a map um, and I could not discern who was me and who was the enemy tank. Also, sometimes who I thought was me because they would be moving the direction I was moving, the, would just, the cursor would just vanish and it would reappear on a different part of Kuwait. And I was like, is my tank teleporting around Kuwait? Because... I thought tanks aren't supposed to do that. Anyway, I, I rolled around for a while. I think I shot one tank and I was like, yeah, this is this is a game. All right. I played the Super Nintendo version, but there is a version available for the Sega Genesis. There's also a Game Gear, Game Boy and GBA version. Maybe I'll try one of those and maybe see if they play any differently. Or maybe I won't and I'll forget about this game after we're done recording. Overall, I don't think it holds up. But Seth, next week you can play Rise of the Robots for the Sega Genesis. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for listening to our episode on Final Fantasy VII. Uh, we'll probably visit the Final Fantasy series uh, again in the future. Based on our track record the last time we talked about a jrpg game was 200 episodes again ago so check back in episode 400 if you want to hear another episode about final fantasy maybe we'll talk about final fantasy 2 or 3 6 which is my favorite game regardless uh, if you want to reach out to us you can send us an email at classic gaming brothers at gmail.com if you want to follow us on social media you can follow us on facebook instagram or twitch all at classic gaming brothers or twitter and blue sky at cg brothers pod you can also find us wherever you listen to your podcast be that spotify apple podcasts or uh I, podbeam for sure which is our host finally uh i think that's it uh, you can email us you can listen to us you can follow us on social medias zach am i missing anything else don't play games like my brother and don't play games like my brother i've been zach and i've been seth and we've been the classic gaming brothers that's, that's right that's right that's right